Hey everyone, welcome to the Smart Economy Podcast, a production of neonewstoday.com. I'm your host, Dylan Grabowski. This is a special episode of the Smart Economy Podcast dedicated to the Decoding Web 3 U.S. campus tour that took place at 14 universities across the U.S. in the month of October 2022. The tour served as a means to showcase some of the best talent in the NEO ecosystem to students across top-notch universities in the U.S. Speakers included representatives from NEO Global Development, the NEO Foundation, NGD Enterprise, Axe Labs, COZ, and NEO News Today. Each of the following sound clips were recorded conversations that took place after presentations to various blockchain clubs and other student organizations at each of the universities we visited. Though, there is one caveat. I participated in three of the four legs of the tour, so unfortunately was not able to interview students from Yale, Boston College, Harvard, MIT, or any of the students that participated in the New York City meetup, including NYU, Columbia, Fordham, Cornell, and Parsons. The following sound clips you're about to hear include students from University of Michigan, Northwestern University, University of Illinois, UCLA, University of Southern California, UC San Diego, UC Berkeley, and Stanford University. As always, just a reminder, nothing said on this podcast is a solicitation to buy or sell any tokens, that nothing should be taken as financial advice, and that the host or guests may hold tokens discussed in any given episode. I really enjoyed having conversations with all these students across the various universities in the United States, and I hope you enjoy the conversations too. So why were we on tour? What were we trying to accomplish? When we're going to various blockchain clubs on campuses, doesn't that mean everyone who's showing up to the Web3 or crypto-related event is already in the know? Isn't that why they're attending an event after school hours? Or was it just for the free pizza and soda? I don't think so. Across my time on tour, it was apparent that students were curious about the technology, ranging from those who heard from a friend of a friend who bought an NFT, or those who were asking us in-depth questions about digital identity solutions. Regardless of their base of blockchain knowledge, the students that attended each of the events were inherently of the entrepreneurial spirit and generally thirsty for knowledge. For example, Henry at UC Berkeley was building a platform to connect Chinese international students and professionals residing in countries across the globe. It's like an um, academic and professional platform for Chinese international students. Cool. And we're um, like emphasizing on coffee chat, coffee chat services. It's, it's basically just like advising services. Like okay. A freelancer platform. Yeah. Because right now the study abroad agency is like crazy expensive. Mm hmm. You're taking like hundreds of thousands of dollars and then providing not enough services just because of the information barrier. So that's what we're trying to break right now. We're trying to break that information barrier. Henry's project is international at its core and sounds like it will be performing cross-border remittances. Surely you must be using Web3 and blockchain, right? This sounds like the best use case. Henry responded, well, no, because I don't know much about blockchain and stuff. That's okay. why I'm here to, you know, to learn a bit. More. For sure. Because yeah. me and my friends, you know, they're doing related stuff. And I just want to catch up a little bit. I pressed on. What do you know about Web3? I said basically nothing. <laughs> well, I know, like, it's, like, decentralized. And then it's, it's like a big idea of Web3, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's more like an idea. But like application-wise, yeah. I know we have DAO and Bitcoin and those stuff. But, For sure. But like, just, like, that's basically all I know. This was an interesting point represented at almost every university we attended. Even the students who weren't deeply knowledgeable about the Web3 space still had an interest in the technology and industry. Web3 is a burgeoning concept that stems from the nascent blockchain and cryptocurrency industry. 
According to Ethereum.org, Web3 has become a catch-all term for the vision of a new, better internet. At its core, Web3 uses blockchains, cryptocurrencies, and NFTs to give power back to the users in the form of ownership. But to many, it might just be that Web3 is a buzzword. What were students doing on campus or in their blossoming careers to show that this isn't the case? Evan from the University of Michigan noted that students are eager to learn more about the Web3 space, which expands across so many industries. The Michigan Cryptocurrency Investment Club, or MCIC for short, is one of the many blockchain clubs on the University of Michigan's campus and is much more interested in bringing in outside professionals to share the variety of opportunities in the industry with club members. Evan said, Trying to bring in a lot of that, the, the leaders in the industry, like just to so kind of do is it'll actually you know show people that the space is much bigger than just like the finance tool. Yeah. You know, the, the blockchain and Web three really fits in so many different industries. Yeah. People don't really realize that yet. Yeah. So we're kind of doing that so that you know to bring on that widespread um, acceptance, and so people start understanding how you know large the industry really is. So there's some of these members like Chris and like some of the other people that are here. They want to really get in the Web three space themselves. Yeah. So they want to do whatever they can to to get those. Opportunities to meet people in the industry. Mm -hmm. You want to find those opportunities, apply to join different cohorts, you know, start going to some of these conferences. Karthik from the University of Michigan also alluded to the depth of knowledge that is necessary to begin grokking with the variety of concepts in Web3. I think it, a lot of it just has to do with making education about blockchain technology clear, right? Because at the surface level, it's very easy to understand what an NFT is, but it's a lot harder to go into some of those other aspects. For the concept of Web3 is just an extension of the blockchain and cryptocurrency industry. So for some students attending the Decoding Web3 events, the concepts weren't new. But hearing from active industry participants was a new experience. Shruti from Northwestern University said, So like I said, I've been in, in it since 2017, and I've only like learned it through like Twitter and like and all of that, like OG, like all of that stuff. But I've never like been at a meeting, like talking about like a project. So this is my first one. So it's very cool. I think I want to like increase that. I think there's like a general interest in it. It's like very casual. Yeah. Like, I just don't think people are, like know enough about it. And like to Raj's point, like it's so hard to like learn it right now. Unless you like have the initiative to go for it. These are like the ones like I look forward to. They're more like exciting. Like there's new I love sharing ideas, learning new stuff. Bobby from UCLA had previous experience as an intern at a VC firm in China and was interested in Web3 concepts surrounding decentralized identity and people being able to own their own data. He said, It's like, I think people are getting interested in the idea and a lot of uh, uh, applications like that, you know, you know? And also, like, uh, this is about the credentials, right? And also about some reputational, some social graph, social relationship. If I build a lot of relationship on like LinkedIn, but I can't just directly transfer the relationship to another DX stuff. Yeah, so with, like, the centralized technology we can actually transfer all our all my social connection from one app to the other one yeah especially within like one ecosystem you know? yeah because the data i generated should be owned by me totally yeah that's like the essence of the id we need such applications for i think that's not an application it's like the infrastructure layer stuff mm -hmm. hansen from the university of southern california went into some of the reasons why Web3 might be on some of the students' radar, but also what might be holding them back. Yeah. And I would say the reason why it's just it's so popular right now it could be like, I don't know, maybe the surge of metaverse, the concept of the metaverse or a surge of the concept like NFTs that actually creates a surge in the industry. Uh, but I do think that most, like the majority of participants in this industry is kind of like newbie or it's just like they do not have like an expert knowledge in this kind of industry right now and they need to be educated. And uh, yeah, I think that's the reason why I find that it is just good to have those kind of events on campus, like high degree school at USC. Adrian from UC San Diego described his personal journey of stumbling into the blockchain club on campus 
what his initial insights into what blockchain and Web3 were all about, and what got him hooked into the field. He said, Yeah, well, I joined when I first came to UCSD. I was looking through the list of clubs. I had heard about blockchain from a friend who was interested in NFTs. And that's all I thought it, blockchain was, just NFTs. When was this? Uh, about two years ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. So I emailed the president of the club at the time, Pun, and I went to the first meeting. And from there on, I was like hooked because they were talking about consensus algorithms and, and protocols and smart contracts. And at the time, I had no clue about any of that. But I had a prior uh, experience with like web development and, and general coding skills. So I was like hooked because I wanted to learn about this new technology. The thing that was so interesting to me about it is that uh, blockchain allows anyone, regardless of like social status or uh, education, education or, like whatever, to access these like financial tools. While many of the students identified what might be blockers for new entrants learning about the Web3 space, Adrian highlighted how engrossing the ubiquitous concepts can become when building a new project. We'll delve into the Speaks project that he referenced later in this episode. Yeah, just the other night I had, I had to study for a, a math midterm, but I was so caught up researching other contracts to get inspiration for Speak that it was like, one, like 3 a.m. and then uh, I realized <laughs> I got to study for this midterm. Based off the conversations with students at the various Decoding Web3 events, it seemed like there was a barrier to entry, but many of their peers had become somewhat accustomed to the terminology. Through many conversations, it seemed like NFTs were red-pilling today's students into the blockchain space. At Northwestern University, a group of three musicians were very interested in discussing the merits of NFTs. For example, Namish discussed the potential for new grassroots fundraising mechanisms. I mean, especially in the, in the musician space, so what you can do is like, it allows for like, crowd grassroots funding from the people that know you the best, because the only people that are going to buy your NFT are the core fans, so you know exactly who appreciates your music the best, and so it allows for, like how you were saying, you can have like exclusive events with your biggest fans. Shoujo from Northwestern University added to the dialogue noting that NFTs can also introduce new ways for established artists to connect with their audience. And not just for new artists, I think like established artists can also give like very exclusive, you know, access like their people, like bands working in studios, their demo tracks or stuff which are really exclusive. Rajat from Northwestern University wanted to continue brainstorming, inquiring how to disrupt other parts of the music industry such as streaming. This is a follow-up there. How does uh, sort of blockchain work in like music streaming? Or like in, in, in the example that you gave, like, you know, cutting an album and putting on the blockchain. So like, apparently you get uh, a, a larger share of the, the fees like, or like the streams. And before I was able to add any insight I might have had, Shoujo was able to identify a way that blockchain could be used as a solution. Payouts, you can bake it into the smart contract that for every stream, part of the royalties directly go to that. While we were at Northwestern University, Professor Kevin Croak from the School of Engineering also attended the event. Afterward, Professor Croak wanted to share more ideas about how to help improve water quality on the African continent, to learn a little more about how NFTs could be used to fundraise startup capital for the proposal, and to discuss the potential phases. He said, Well, what about starting something in water quality in Africa? Because I grew up with the Archbishop of Ghana. We would try to train the parish personnel to do water quality samples. Because as you may know, the water quality problems in Africa are monstrous. Initially, we thought we'd just do an NFT, raise some funds, we put together online material to train parish personnel in doing water quality, and they've got a monstrous amount of health care facilities totally. uh, there. So, yeah, there, there is a what I would think would be a natural fit on this. 
And the idea would be to try it out on this one archdiocese, and if it works, it wouldn't be too hard to spin it up. Phase one would be really cheap. We would just do a survey of, of all the parish personnel on what they know about the water. Are they willing to participate in the effort in some rather basic stuff? The second stage would be to put together an online training. We need that. I mean, uh, this, this is not, the roadmap is still not clear, but uh, I was inspired. Shruti from Northwestern University was also intrigued by the potential use cases for NFTs, citing opportunities in real estate, and how NFTs can increase the liquidity of real-world assets. What I'm most excited about probably for blockchain, um, like my ideas around it are one is real estate. Mm, yes. NFTs, like their biggest market is going to be real estate. Yeah. I'm super pumped about it. It's like so much more liquid automatically. It's like smart contracts change the whole game. Hansen from the University of Southern California shared that he's building an NFT project and the thought process behind why he's building on the Aptos chain which was launched by members of the team that worked on Meta's former stablecoin project, Diem. Hansen said, I'm currently doing NFT collections, planning to build on um, Aptos. Nice. New layer one chain. Why Aptos? You know, it's a good story. Uh, that's the first reason. And um, I believe that, that that is the project built by Facebook, which is an app that is capable of operating in a million level of users. So that, I do believe that the future of Web3 definitely t- need to follow the path of customers like to, to see and mm-hmm. instead of just like focusing on the technology part because consumers don't actually care about that. It was interesting to hear about Hansen's focus on following the path that leads to the most users. As with many of the DAP developers I've spoken with over the years on the Neo News Today podcast and Smart Economy podcast, builders create projects because they want to inevitably improve the lives of the end users that use their products. And as with many of those conversations, it was really enjoyable to hear passionate developers talk about their projects and speaking with the students on the Decoding Web3 US campus tour, the feeling was just the same. Heaven from the University of Michigan was interested in creating an investment DAO that would be managed by the students in the MCIC. He said, Maybe a DAO, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe a, we, we've been talking to Syndicate, yeah. maybe about opening up an investment club as a part of the organization mm-hmm. where we collectively, you know, do investment pitches and as a group decide on which assets to invest in. But the only issue is we don't want to force the members to put the money together and pull and start investing. Yeah. We're working on hitting some deliverables so then we can start reaching out to these larger companies to get funding. Jackson from the University of Michigan explained how he'd initially worked on a passion project that focused on the security token market, which turned into an internship and will become a full-time job once he's graduated from school. So it started um, as kind of a passion project, but at this point, yeah, I'm working full time with a company. The company is called Security Token Market. Cool. They're actually full time out of Miami. We're just looking at any asset that is meets the definition of a traditional security. Yeah. And so, honestly, a lot of traditional cryptos look like that, but we're not really focused on that. We're focused on people that are going out and compliantly issuing assets, whether it be a real estate token, venture capital fund, and uh, equity backed token. That back token. For sure. And so we're actually pulling data from, I believe it's you know, almost 20 exchanges international, cool. tracking about 300 different securities. And we are actually undergoing like the first ever tokenized Reg CF fundraising on that blockchain. And so, yeah, we're doing a bunch of really cool stuff. We're producing content around all of our data. We're tracking all of those tokens, like I said. And yeah, just really helping to build that audience. So I was working with them full, uh, full time this summer. I actually got introduced to them through my internship the previous summer. Started working with them part-time for about a year, and then I went and I traveled abroad, and I kept working with them. That was the first time I came on in like a full part-time role. I was helping out before as an intern. And yeah, I was down there full-time with them this summer, and it's been since. Karthik from the University of Michigan is interested in leveraging NFTs to provide royalties to musicians and artists. 
During the presentations, his ears perked when Gil Machado from Axe Labs referenced digital rights management in his presentation. Karthik said, I was telling him about our concept for a music NFT platform looking into DRM, and we've been trying to figure out sort of how to look into the different tool sets, or, you know, be able to track down who the royalties need to be paid out to, because, yeah. you know, there's there's like a like a Beyonce song, for example, has up to like 11 co-creators, and, and most like NFT marketplaces don't even have that functionality to add royalty splitting. Yeah, so we're building an MVP, right? now again it's just going to be through like different types of nft so i think the main thing we're focusing on first is distribution of music because i think that's gated in the industry right now a lot of a lot of musicians have to go through a lot of middlemen to sort of even distribute their music like like for, for spotify you have to go through another distributor and then put your music on spotify they take a cut of your money right and sometimes you're not even making enough to pay for the distributor like they take i think upwards of like 40 dollars or something and to to get a Starbucks coffee, you need about 675 streams. And a Starbucks is almost like one-tenth the price of a distributor, right? For sure. So those are just some of the problems. I think distribution is the first thing to tackle. And then we're going to try and look into ownership, sort of making verification a more solid part of it. Sammer is the president of the UC San Diego Club, Blockchain at San Diego. He described the two projects that members of the club are currently working on and the points in the development process that both projects are at. He said, Yeah, right now we have like an NFT infrastructure and subscription project. We have Speak and we have one that's like attempting to do credit and l lending. And, oh, sweet. And so they're still really like in the beginning phase because we're in the fall quarter and these are like the very initial stages. But we have had other projects that have been like completed and won like hackathons and and uh, right now people are attempting to get like funding and work on them full time. Adrian, who's also a member at the UC San Diego Blockchain Club, is working on the Speak project. And he went into further detail about it and the impetus behind the project. Yeah, so right now we're working on a project called Speak, which is essentially going to be a, not fully decentralized, decentralized is an aspect of it, but it's going to be a writing platform that takes the aspects of Medium and Substack and combines them into one, um, like, really user-friendly platform. A big part of it is this idea of censorship resistance, so we want to give writers the opportunity to publish content that is censorship resistant because it lives on the blockchain. So... The idea sprouted from like people in countries that have oppressive governments not being able to speak out or, or, or you know being criminalized because of that. So that's sort of where the initial idea sprouted. Right now we're a team of six. It's like me and Leo on smart contracts. We have like two front end devs, a back end dev, and we're, we're we're just starting out. We're starting out to we're starting to write out the contracts. Just recently we onboarded some some new members. And so we're taking any talent that we can find, we're onboarding them just to help us build out. It's like you're interviewing someone, you hear them talking about all these their experience, and you're just thinking like, oh, they would be great on the, on the team. You know, we got to get them on. In addition to the scope of the Speak project, it was refreshing to hear the passion that Adrian had for finding new club members and onboarding them into the current teams. Across all of the campuses we visited on the tour, there was at least one blockchain club or student organization focusing on the Web3 space. And that was probably the key takeaway I took from the Decoding Web3 US Campus Tour. Those in the industry should not overlook student blockchain clubs. Across all the campuses we visited, each of the clubs operated in a different way, and each campus had a different club culture, and each club had a different focus area. Some clubs were more focused on the technical side of things, while others on the investment side of things. And then other clubs simply covered broad Web3 cryptocurrency blockchain concepts. Though, ultimately, all of the clubs aimed to provide a similar service, to educate students in the Web3 space and onboard those with the drive to become part of it. Drew from the University of Michigan described how he became interested in founding the MCIC blockchain club on campus. 
We just start. I mean, I, I personally always wanted. I, I just have always been interested in the space, really, and like, I know that I'm no genius in, in the space. And like, some some of my kids are like, like, wizards at coding, and like they just you know they do projects on their own for fun. So passionate about it. It was through this acknowledgement that Drew was inspired to create a blockchain club that could unite people of all interests and skill levels by offering a community where anyone and everyone was welcome. I wanted to start a group of people who were interested and like, you know, I knew you were doing that. I could learn more and I've learned a ton more. And then um, it's kind of just, I'd say, a group of, you know, it's nothing too like, I don't know if you know about the club culture here, but it's pretty intense here. And it's more more like laid back, you know, come by if you want to. Here's, here's an opportunity, take it as you will. Um, come by, listen to this Neo event, another speaker series. And uh, so through that, it's just kind of like we had like a education curriculum that, um, I mean, not everyone has to go through because some people know way more than me even. But, like, we want the new members to know nothing. You know, we want to onboard them in the world, like, slowly. You know, like, we'll spend one meeting just on what's blockchain and then the next one on, you know, what's a crypto and then yeah. the next one, what's an NFT. Yeah. If you want to be meeting these people, there's a place where you can do that. It's great. And, uh, it's, like, kind of just, you know, people are building out different kinds of things and working in different industries. And it's fun to even just hear about and learn about and know someone personally. That can connect you there. Bobby from UCLA went on to describe the two clubs on his campus, but also acknowledged where there's a gap in the club offerings. He said, Yeah, that's what I really want to know because um, I know there's only two blockchain clubs on campus. One is for trading and the other one is for technical. There's like a empathy spot for people knowing or just basically generally learning Web3 and some basic stuff and also uh, projects like you guys are doing. Shiv from the University of Southern California described the grassroots-oriented nature of the blockchain clubs at USC, but also the differences between the initiative of club organizers at USC versus what he perceives of the organizers at UCLA. At USC, we do have blockchain club, which uh, a lot of my a lot of my friends are a part of, which, is, which has been doing super well. But another thing which USC really has is like they have a lot of Discord groups which aren't like formally organized by USC. Cool. But they have a bunch of like Discord groups where it's just like people who like trade NFTs and are USC students who like they talk about like NFT, crypto and poker like all day. And it's like different strategies and like it's a very cool group which I've been a part of for quite some time. What I find in like my USC friends compared to my UCLA friends is they're definitely more like crypto and like blockchain inclined. But I also think that that's because USC takes like a lot of initiative to like have from what I understand, more events than UCLA. The event at UC San Diego probably had the lowest turnout of all the events that I spoke at while on tour, but each student that attended was actively involved in the club, and almost all of those in the audience were building their own products or working on one of the two projects somewhat spearheaded by the club. Samer, the president of blockchain at San Diego, shared the club's mission and vision how they engage their members, and the type of education they seek to share with participants. Yeah, I think like in general, our club is much more egalitarian than most, and people like tend to hold responsibilities and wear many hats. Whether they're in events or finance, they tend to, like, for example, the events lead will help finance an event, and the finance person will help finance the club. And so there's a lot of synergy between people, and so the the handoff process tends to be very smooth. Since day one, we've been focusing on projects, education, and, and design, and just connecting people up to opportunities, and we also do research. So no, mostly projects, education, and research. Those Sick. are the three like pillars that we focus on. Um, and so just getting project teams that build actual useful projects and, uh, and researching things that aren't just summaries but are actually deep and insightful for mm -hmm. the community. That, that is one uh, aspect of it. Another is like you know, workshops. We try to like bring people and uh, you know show them how to like uh, basically do like coding workshops and sometimes just record stuff and post on our YouTube or send it to Discord and basically you know post tutorials and walkthroughs and things of that nature. We also do like uh, alpha leaks, which are like knowledge sharing sessions where people who like specialize in, for example, we have someone who's like a really privacy maxi who's like really into privacy coins and so they'll come out and they'll like uh, do a whole presentation like uh, every three, four weeks on this topic and, and basically everyone has like a niche subject. Like we, we try to get everyone to like 
focus on one thing and then they tend to do like knowledge sharing sessions every three, four, five weeks on something about that. I guess the mission is just to like do more research that isn't like bland, surfaced and very summary oriented. Like we are trying right now to do more deep dives, things that are specific towards certain projects. Uh, you know, based on our connections to industry, we've heard that those types of research projects are the most like revenue generating for companies and like, help companies like, you know, understand the space in general more. So those are like the, the main uh, research projects we're focusing on. I was curious to hear how they solicited membership for the club. And Samer went on to say, We do market the club in like uh, the general like engineering oriented um, uh, events. But a lot of the people who came have come from referrals uh, from students who are already in the club because the people who are in are very passionate and they tell their friends about it. And that, that's become like one of our most like useful uh, venues of like attracting talent just like telling your friends that you know that this is great these are our projects you know you're going to learn a lot we've had some people who have gotten full-time jobs that they balance their full-time jobs with their with them being a student full-time and they're able to do that and so that's very inspiring to students who are you know not as active and they tend to you know get excited and come and, and contribute to the projects and things like that adrian also a member at uc san diego's blockchain club shared more information about how the onboarding process helped create a camaraderie amongst the new members and the club's existing members. He said, So, uh, like, Eduardo, myself, and Leo, the, the other person we were talking to, yeah. and, like, we all joined at the same time, and we got onboarded by, by doing this thing called School of Base, which is where the core founders of the club um, gave us, like, weekly homeworks where we had to research things, uh, do interactive assignments, and so from that we gained, like, our initial knowledge, and then also through that we became close friends to the point where we're comfortable working on projects together, hanging out outside of Base. So it really helps like cult- cultivate this community that, that I feel like comfortable working with and, and that I know that I know they all share the same passion as me. Maya at Stanford University briefly discussed another way in which the cross-pollination of colleges at a university can be intriguing to students who are seeking to build. I'm part of like the blockchain site, you know, I go to the seminar as well, and um, there's also an ideation platform where you can like join students in like the business school, or, like CS, you know, how to code different, like, mm-hmm. on different platforms, so I might check that out later on today. Those of us speakers were on tour to talk about Web3 careers, but we were also showcasing heavy hitters in the NEO ecosystem to highlight the Neo blockchain's tech stack. Folks like NGD Enterprises' John Devados and Harry Pearson, COZ's Tyler Adams, and Axe Labs' Claude Mueller and Gil Machado presented along the various stops, which not only inspired the technical aspects of students, but also helped them envision product ideas. At many of the universities, I asked students, Was there anything specifically about the Neo blockchain stack during the presentations that intrigued them? Maya from Stanford University said an idea for online communities came to mind, though she didn't want to share too much information as it's still early stages. She went on to say, So it's something that can be integrated on like community spaces like Discord and Telegram as well as websites. So I don't want to give it away because it's a very simple idea, but I think that like it can revolutionize a lot of things within crypto and non crypto. It literally came to me when I was watching. (laughs) Yeah, like one of the slides, I'm like, oh, actually, like if we did this, then this would make this so much easier. So yeah, um, but I need to like go away and actually crack it. and like see if it makes sense. Evan from the University of Michigan acknowledged the skills and expertise of the speakers on tour and expressed interest in hearing more from them at future student-oriented events. It's just the opportunities that, that, yeah, we're that by you, know, you guys are providing. Yeah. Just for the members that really want to get in the space, it would be more, you know, once we start hosting that speaker series or once we're getting ready to do a conference, we'd love to have somebody from Neo come in, maybe have them involved in a career fair where you could find people that want to work in different sectors within Neo. Drew from the University of Michigan admitted he's no developer, but found value in the polyglot nature of the Neo VM, which is able to compile languages like Python, C Sharp, Go, Java, and TypeScript. He said, 
To get back what you were saying about what's beneficial about Neo, I think uh, the whole C++, Python, and uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm no coding god. Neither am I. Like, I mean, it seems I, I, super inviting. Yeah, it does. And I think, like, you know, if some of the other computer science majors, they came, I think they would benefit from that and they kind of take that and say, hey, uh, you know, I'll maybe try this out. I already know how to code. He also went on to acknowledge the novelty of Neo's dual token model. Yeah, so the whole, the whole gas system is cool. I don't know about that. Jackson from the University of Michigan noted that blockchain in general is making it easier to share value among participants of various ecosystems. He also alluded to the depth of Neo's tool sets and how they might make it easier to integrate communities. Uh, it's all of this, all blockchain in general, it's all at its core. Neo blockchain in general, I mean, mm-hmm. security token market, the company I work yeah. with. All this stuff, you need a community around around you. And if you're a part of a community and you want to be a part of it and you want to participate and add value, you're more or less going to get value in return. And it's going to be the fair, the more fair value is basically really the totally. coolest part. Like we're actually building these economies now that are going to allow for people to get paid what they deserve for the work that they're doing. Yeah. And that's really the coolest thing for me. And so seeing all the different tools you guys have built like to make it so easy to integrate a community, what in literally just all the tooling it's cool. so cool Karthik from the University of Michigan described the importance of identity when it comes to digital resource management of the NFT platform for musicians he and his team are building during Tyler's part of the presentation he'd often go into detail about neo id which is among the various features that Karthik and his team need he said um, we were just kind of looking into different like infrastructures that we could use to solve it and I, I saw one of the toolkits and the identification part was really nice and I was just curious as to whether we could use that to you know assign like music as like I guess to like an artist always like record it, like record that that it's that artist's work and like easily verify that it, it is that artist's work like that you guys hit that on the nail I was like oh that's something that we were looking into how do we do DRM with the blockchain what sort of technologies do we need Bobby from UCLA also acknowledged Neo's toolkits and how they can help non-developers utilize blockchain networks the most interesting thing I found is like back then the blockchain is only for people that can do uh, coding for engineer but now like Neo brought a lot of toolkits uh, and we can do actually for for designer for business students for like everyone for writers for, writers, yeah, yeah. for journalists yeah. right like everybody can participate in the web3 world and kind of we can find our position and to find a team to join a part of the presentation I delivered on the tour was focused on how Neo's community has supported various projects throughout its history. I went on to showcase four projects with beginnings in the Neo ecosystem, including Ghost Market, Switchio, OnRamper, and Greenfinch, each of which have been successful in acquiring funds, be it through venture capital raises, hackathon awards, or grant funding from community funding DAOs. Samer from UC San Diego said that he really appreciated the overview of these projects and their humble beginnings. I think in general, like highlighting the different you know projects that were built on and, and the processes by which they were funded and and the way in which you like laid out specific examples, those were all very helpful for us to like see uh, cool. you know other people who started projects and how they got them funded and basically you know and got up to speed and, and that's like things that's something that we found you know pretty useful and we talked about it just a minute ago. To support any students who gained an interest in NEO as a result of our presentation, NEO News Today offered micro grants of up to $3,000 to any student who wanted to build a DAP, tool, or project in the NEO ecosystem. Adrian from UC San Diego said that was something about the presentations that might incentivize him to test out NEO's tooling, especially since it might have less strings attached than a larger grant. I'm interested in, in, in uh, building with the tools you mentioned to get to possibly get some of the grants For sure. that you guys are doing because I want to explore the different possibilities. Yeah, and I, I think it's I think the like built-in features that you guys have 
on the platform are, are really interesting and would simplify things as a developer. The ones that stood out to me the most were like the micro grants because for those you don't actually have to build something full scale. You can start small and just starting is like the important part and then from there you can start to build on more and more. So yeah, I think um, oftentimes these like big grants are, are seem sort of overwhelming because you feel like you have to do so much but being able to start off with like something small, get a micro grant, and then build on from that is like enticing and gives me more motivation to build. And Maya from Stanford University found value in hearing different topics discussed among different subject matter experts throughout the presentation. She noted that presentations are often delivered by one person and don't offer a variety of insights. I feel like the way it was set up was actually really good because normally you just get one person talking for the whole thing and it was good to have someone who had like an expertise in different aspects so I thought that was excellent. I thought the layout was pretty good. The thing that I found most incredible after talking with all the students was that they were just as aligned with the future of the technology and industry as I am. We believe there's opportunity to build great tools, products, and dApps. Currently, many universities don't offer quote-unquote blockchain degrees, but that won't stop the students we met along the Decoding Web3 U.S. campus tour. Nearly every student I spoke with gave me a glimmer into their future in the Web3 space. One of the major points I really tried to convey during my portion of the presentation was the nascency of the Web3 space and how anyone can carve out a role for themselves if they've been here for a small amount of time. Evan from the University of Michigan spoke a little to this point. I've been talking to people and they're saying, if somebody's engaging in Web3 while they're in school, why not take them in straight from school? They know the space. They may not know the technicals like somebody in IB will, but they know the space well. So, you know, maybe if you, if you, you know, give that education in, in college, then they'll be ready for those roles. This point was further expanded upon by Jackson from the University of Michigan, who nodded to the company that he'll be working with full time when he graduates. That's one of the main reasons I really like working in this space. Uh, yeah. They really took a chance on me because I was in a position where I had time, wanted to work, and was educated enough in the space, and have just been able to learn from their fantastic team. And yeah, they've really put. A, it's gr the team's grown from about twelve to thirty people since I've been there, and everyone around me has really made it super easy. We've got a ton of different projects we're working on right now that are super exciting, and I yeah. kind of at the core of it all with the team. Since I've been here for a while now. Shiv from the University of Southern California noted the uplifting mentality of Web3 participants exhibited by the memetic phrase, we're all going to make it or wag me, and also shared his insights into the many opportunities to piecemeal income streams together. I feel like a big fear a lot of people have is the element of job security. And while that's definitely a valid concern, because like the corporate structure quote-unquote might be more safe what they don't realize is crypto also gives you so many more avenues to like be engaged like you can work like six part-time jobs like being a mod like, like i have friends who like moderate in three discord groups trade nfts trade crypto and are also like working on like community building and like writing like sdks for like <laughs> projects and they do it all in like all that collectively in like four or five hours a day because people don't realize how like you can be engaged with people and profit off that. You can like make content like like you did and like profit off that. You can like use the skills you have and just like even with airdrops, like our friends who literally just have he, have, he has like a calendar of all the airdrops coming in the next month and it's just like free money that comes in. I think Web3 is a much more like uplifting and engaging environment where people are way more friendly and everyone wants each other, like wag me, everyone wants each other to succeed. Yeah, totally. So I definitely think that when you're more open-minded about it and see the opportunity there instead of the risk, it's like a place that you never look back at. Carrie from the University of Illinois is interested in how Web3 can incentivize content creators. She said, Among all those Web3 concepts and the applications I'm interested in, like, what are the ways that can actually bring profits to creators, mm -hmm. like, um, motivates creators to, to create more stuff and get rewarded by their, like, efforts. Karthik from the University of Michigan described his passion for the music field 
and how it led him to finding a partnership with a friend who was interested in working in the blockchain industry. I'm in the music industry. I love, I love free. I want to work in the music industry. And I had a friend who works in the blockchain industry. So we kind of sat down together one day. Like I just invited him over. You know, we were just discussing sort of what we're passionate about. And then we realized we could put the two together. Um, and then we, were, we sort of discussed that a little bit further. We have some sort of a plan. Then he went on to talk about his potential future clients, artists he met when he was visiting NYU, who simply want to put their music out there without learning various technical processes. Like I was down in the new university in New York and I spoke to a lot of art students and they said, I just want to be able to put my music out and make some money. I don't really care about all the complex processes. Henry from UC Berkeley, who was building the coffee chat service platform mentioned at the beginning of this episode, gets the sense that he should integrate Web3 elements into his platform, even if it's just because he perceives there to be more of an interest from VC firms. I noticed that like, if you're doing something related to Web3, you're likely to get <laughs> more investments. That's what I'm feeling right now. Yeah. If you're doing something related to Web3, like, you know, the VCs are going to like you more. Shruti from Northwestern University is obtaining her MBA and wants to become a founder, but she's also explored Web3 development. She shared some interesting insights into the concept behind coding on blockchain, why it's an intriguing space to enter, but also what she's found difficult about entering Web3. I took the Solidity Bootcamp. What I found the most interesting was like, um, you're literally co practicing coding on the blockchain. So like, you know, it's like weird because all your mistakes are technically embedded. You do it like forever. <laughs> That, that was the strangest concept, I think, that I was like, trying to learn it. So I, um, I want to be a founder eventually. Cool, so yeah. I have a couple of projects in mind, but they're not blockchain related, mm. more just social impact based. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but I think blockchain can go into social impact, kind of, because there's like opportunities for like the unbanked and everything, right? The part I've struggled with is how to like put myself out there, yeah. get the resources. While there might be a lot of promise in the future of Web3, which is an industry built on trustless, permissionless networks, there are still elements of concern when it comes to finding partners that founders and builders can trust. Maya from Stanford University said, I guess it's because I don't know anyone in the Neo space, so I would be going in, like, going in blind, I guess. So it would be good to know how to like establish trust with people that I don't know in person, but then it's like, if it gets to the level where you kind of have to be docked, like, can you trust the person that you've been working with yeah. for so long to not just like take it? i being docked, but I'm just... Oh, gotcha. I, know, like, I just don't know how to find people Within the, uh, Sammer from UC San Diego didn't necessarily address Maya's concerns in our conversation, but he did relay tips about successes he's found while spearheading the blockchain at San Diego Club. My number one advice, just thinking back to like when I initially started and knew very little about the, the space, is just uh, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you uh, in, in blockchain, which I know you said during your talk, and I 100% agree that that's like the, one of the main reasons why I'm here, Sweet. is because my co-founder is smarter than me and uh, you know, helped accelerate my learning, and um, that overall was like, it made the process fun, because you were learning while you were starting a club, and, and um, you know, it's a lot easier to convince people to build projects if you believe in those projects and if you believe in the space. And if you're with people that are smarter than you and believe more and, and build better stuff, and then it keeps inspiring you to, to try harder. Adrian from UC San Diego relayed his experiences of getting his first taste of building a dApp and applying for a hackathon that he and his team ultimately won. This gave him the cursory knowledge into what it was like to join a startup. He went on to say, um, but I know that we've gotten funding for events in the past. Um, yeah. But then, aside from that, like for the projects, before doing Speak, uh, I actually was part of a project called Karma. Well, it changed from Karma to Sugar Block, um, <laughs> which was like a platform where people could donate to nonprofits using um, cryptocurrency. Sweet. Um, like Giveth? Yeah. Kind of. And so we actually ended up winning a hackathon uh, for $15,000. So that was a really cool experience because it 
sort of give me an introduction into like the field of blockchain startups and, and coding smart contracts and everything. And that was like when I first joined the club. So that got me pumped because I realized there were so many opportunities to build and yeah. and there were so many opportunities like financial incentives too, like For winning sure. winning a hackathon. Yeah, it's I, sick, I, I hadn't even considered uh, joining a hackathon prior to joining the club. Armed with this knowledge, I asked if Adrian had a job lined up after school, and if he didn't, was he worried about the job market? Not as of yet. I'm looking to... I sort of spent... Since I'm only a sophomore, I sort of spent the first year sort of building my own projects and, sure. and getting experience, like joining startups. We're actually hoping to make Speak, uh, the project I mentioned initially, like yeah. a, a real thing. So we're committing pretty hard on that. We're going to try and get funding and everything. Yeah. It's definitely like... Um, there's a definite like learning curve because when you're first starting off, there's so much to learn that you never don't know what to how to process it. But For sure. once you get over that like initial curve, everything starts to click and then yeah, that's when you can start like building and, and getting your hands dirty. Bobby from UCLA acknowledged the difficulty that international students might have obtaining work visas to gain employment in the U.S. But he also alluded to the opportunities to work remotely in Web3. He went on to discuss building a DAO as his first potential venture. I think I, I, I really want to stay and stay, but like I'm an international student, so it's hard for me to get sponsor stuff. Yeah, so uh, another thing is maybe I can find a decentralized job, so I work in somewhere uh, away, like, and I can still do blockchain stuff. I think it's quite important because there's a lot of contents that has been rated uh, in China, but has not been like translated or uh, still some language barrier stuff. And maybe there's a dog can do this uh, transfer content. I think it's a really good chance for builders to build up their project in their market and also get some funding maybe. I really want to uh, find some people, like some engineers, and also some people who want to start a business but haven't yet found their partners or our teammates, you know. But of course, for some students, simply working in the crypto space can be a dream job of theirs. Hansen from the University of Southern California said, When I graduate, I was just gonna. My dream job is kind of like getting into a crypto fund and starting to do some crypto investing and also working on my startup. Based off of all of these conversations, it was apparent that the current short term bear market cycle hasn't had an impact on the vision of the future of tomorrow's builders in Web3 blockchain, and cryptocurrency. At each stop of the Decoding Web3 U.S. campus tour, there was engaging discussion among the attendees and the subject matter experts that spoke about the NEO ecosystem and Web3 space. Personally, I could not be any more enthusiastic about where those who were interviewed as a part of this episode will end up in a few years and truly look forward to potentially collaborating or working alongside these students once they've graduated and are beginning to build their careers. To conclude, I'll reiterate a point I previously mentioned in this episode. To all of those who are currently building in the blockchain and Web3 space, do not sleep on blockchain clubs at universities. Tomorrow's leaders are already building today. On that note, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Smart Economy podcast. If you liked what you heard and want to support the show, please keep NEO News Today in mind when voting for your NEO Council representative as part of NEO's governance process. We appreciate you and look forward to catching you next time.